recording this meeting. Um, I'm on my iPad for a second because my Mac is still rebooting through uh, an update of the OS, which I should not have said yes to a little while ago. Um, turns in, it turned into a half hour thing instead of a usual five minute thing. So there must be some kind of a major update. And we are convening here, oops. We are convening here on, um, what day is today? 28th. Oh, 28th, yeah, there it is. Uh, we are here on August 28th, 2020, uh, to talk about soil fertility and the food nexus, um, what we might do, how to look at it, things like that. And um, Klaus, do you want to just start in? Good. Can I take the screen? I believe, give it a try. And if you can't, I'll figure out on my iPad how to give you. Yeah, it's disabled. Then let's. Uh, make host. How about that? Uh, hold on. Let me see if I can make you co-host because I think that might. There we go. Assign co-host. Much better. You should now be able to. Yep, that works. Cool. Okay, so we have my screen. So I've just put together a few of my uh, slides from different presentations um, to to uh, you know, to build a case, so to speak. Um, and when we start just with the carbon budget, which uh, you know, what everyone here is familiar with, as of 2018, we had 193 billion tons left. We are consuming roughly 37 billion tons per year. So the way this looks like <clears throat> in, in graphic form is in order to have a 66% chance to stay within a 1.5 degree Celsius budget, um, this is what would have to happen in the in the global emissions output, and global emissions output is not just energy. You know, it is the, it is the entire system. Agriculture, for example, accounts for roughly a third of of, of that uh, number. So, focusing specifically on the food supply, if you think about carrying capacity. We're currently at roughly 7.7 .7 billion people. We're supposed to get to 8.6 billion by 2030 and come anywhere near to 10 billion by 2050. Um, if you, there is, there is a, uh, an organization, it's called overshoot.org, and they're tracking the, the use of uh, global resources, uh, uh, non-renewable non resources. And according to, to their calculations, we're current, currently using 1.7 times the reproductive capacity of the planet. In more specific ways, 90% of global fish stocks are already either fully fished out or overfished beyond their replenishment rate. Aquivers are being pumped worldwide beyond their replenishment rate. And we have lost about 40% of, of our arable land uh, and the soil. So if you take, <clears throat> we are currently, this is an older, this is a 2018 uh, file here, 7.6 billion people divided by 1.7 gives you roughly 4.5 billion people we could, the, the planet could support based on current consumption patterns. Um, and and so, so while we are increasing our population, we are also increasing the per capita consumption uh, in, in countries like China and India in the developing world. Um, another phenomena here is risk levels of concentrations. When you look at California as an example, and look at the amazing uh, concentration of what California produces in fresh food, uh, yet the, the state you know, is running out of water and has these amazing droughts. So the... the uh, um, uh, and, and you can take other core key crops, you know, where you would you would find uh, uh, similar similar patterns. So the the industry, of course, over the last you know, 30, 40 years has has uh, focused on concentration and 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 scale in order to lower their cost and you know, make themselves more competitive. But you know, here here is some of the the price we pay for that. The oceans. Um, carbon pollution, carbon has a unique impact on the ocean. Um, one is that it's warming up uh, and uh, uh, you know, causing uh, en enormous disruptions there. 
is for, for, for warming. The other one is acidification. You know, coral reefs are expected to be depleted. 90% of the world's reefs will be gone basically by 2050 based on current patterns. Um, and the Arctic sea ice is disappearing. So, so the, the, uh, uh, the seafood supply is, is completely at risk uh, when, you, when you look at this in aggregate. The health of the population here, this just came out uh, a month ago or so, the 2020 dietary guidelines. The, the commission um, that was charged with this as a group of scientists went beyond what they have been asked to do that for the first time ever. The, the Trump administration gave them a specific scope and, 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 and a narrowly defined focus. And the commission went beyond it and uh, said that we have not been asked to do this, but we said we're doing it anyway. Um, so they, they, what, what they are pointing out here is that 70% of the American population are either overweight or obese. Um, 40% of the population have two or more chronic conditions which are nutrition related. Uh, on top of it, you have food insecurity and lack of access to affordable healthy food, which is a huge problem. It was actually the first uh, paper I ever wrote uh, after my retirement in 2012 was on, on food deserts. I had no idea what a food desert is, but you know, there, there are uh, in areas in the inner cities and in rural districts where there is like no access to fresh food or to, to uh, fresh protein. Um, so, you know, in the, in a quick depressing summary here of, of where we really are. So then you go, so what are our options? So basically, um, we have energy and, and energy has been discussed for decades now. Uh, so there is a, a, a broad understanding in the population uh, of, uh, you know, uh, change your light bulbs, put insulation in the house, uh, uh, drive an energy efficient car. So there has been a lot of micro uh, uh, management of, of uh, mitigating behavior uh, to, to reduce our energy consumption. There has been nothing really in, the ter in terms of photosynthesis. Uh, and photosynthesis partly uh, is the, the use of plants and, and natural systems to sequester carbon into soil. And that's really where uh, the focus now is uh, getting, getting uh, uh, intensely so um, of uh, saying we have to focus on photosynthesis for a myriad of reasons, you know, to protect our soil, to absorb uh, carbon into soil, um, and to, uh, to uh, regenerate the nutritional value of food. So there's a number of reasons here that, uh, that come together into a massive uh, umbrella that uh, uh, would uh, define what, what photosynthesis stands for. There is an organization, uh, it's called the 4 per 1000 Initiative, was founded by France. Um, that has single-mindedly focused on, uh, uh, on soil uh, to increase the carbon content of soil in order to counteract uh, the, the continuous increase of atmospheric CO2. Um, so I'm linked with the Secretary General of this organization and uh, I'm the liaison for the Sierra Club for the, for the uh, uh, citizen climate lobby, business climate leaders with this organization. And I've been working with them now for you know, uh, a couple of years. Um, and that, that, is, that has turned into a global initiative in the United States. It's represented by Regeneration International, um, by the Organic Consumer Association. Who are, who are really focused on this. There's a very quick uh, three minute video here. I don't know if, uh, uh, if it works to, to play this. Let me see if that uh, no, it shows sure. up on another screen. Soils for food security and climate. Human activities release enormous quantities of carbon dioxide CO2 into the atmosphere. This intensifies the greenhouse effect and accelerates climate change. 
Every year, plants recover 30% of CO2 thanks to their process of photosynthesis. Later, when the plants die and decompose, living organisms in the soil, such as bacteria, fungi, and earthworms, transform them into organic matter. This carbon rich organic matter is essential for human food because it holds water, nitrogen, and phosphorus which are essential to the growth of plants. The world's soil contains two to three times more carbon than the atmosphere. Increasing this storage of carbon by 0.4% per year, or four parts per thousand, in the top 30 or 40 centimeters of the soil could stop the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is the proposal of the Four Parts Per Thousand Soils for Food Security and the Climate Initiative. The increase in carbon storage in soils would therefore contribute not only to stabilizing the climate, but also to ensuring food security, that is, the supply of sufficient food for all people. How can it be carried out? Policy measures must be established to reduce deforestation and encourage ecological farming practices that boost the amount of organic matter in soils and meet the four parts per thousand every year objective. Examples would be avoid leaving the soil bare so as to limit carbon loss, restore crops, pastures and degraded forests, Plant trees and legumes that have the ability to fix atmospheric nitrogen in the soil. Use manure and composts to nourish the soil. Or allow water to collect at the base of plants. Who is targeted? There are 570 million farms in the world and more than 3 billion people living in rural areas that could implement these practices. At what cost? To restore agricultural soils, it would cost a few dozen dollars per hectare. However, agroforestry and the renewal of forests would require more investments. And for how long? The sequestration of carbon in soil would continue for 20 to 30 years after the good farming practices are put in place, provided these practices are maintained. Under the Four Parts Per Thousand initiative, researchers are coming together with farmers, associations, economic stakeholders, regions and countries for the purpose of food security and climate. So that, I'm sorry, so this, so this uh, has um, taken on a, a lot of energy in, and uh, that, that you, you, you see um, uh, the Queen of Deal, for example, made a host of initiatives that are, that are focused on, on this particular topic. Um, so that, and it's roughly framed as regenerative, and I should put in organic agriculture, uh, new, new land management practices, and so on. So, we, so there is part material out there, you know, when you go online, you can, you can find uh, a lot of information of where that is. It's pretty mature at this point. Um, and so coming more towards what we want to talk about, uh, the regeneration of soil really depends on local conditions. You now, first of all, what is the existing condition of soil? What's the local climate? What's the availability of water? And what are the socioeconomic? Socioeconomics is, for example, the availability of labor. Um, but also preferences, dietary preferences and things of that sort. Uh, the, the purchasing power of the population plays a role. So the industrial food system you know, cannot reform itself without uh, active participation by an informed public. Uh, it's a, it's a two-way uh, stream here um, because any, any change has to be built from the ground up, community level, nature is local. But changing crop cycles and types of crops requires a corresponding change in menus and dietary habits. And so that's where the crux is. Um, the, the, the farmer will have to use, for example, cover crops. Cover crops are legumes. 
So when you look at the cuisines of countries like, the, let's say, the middle the, around the Mediterranean, uh, or you look at Vietnam, Japan, China, their menus are, are linked in with the food that they have been producing over generations. You know, there are cultures that have lived on the same soil for thousands of years without destroying it. So we, you know, so so we are in the process of of absolutely, you know, destroying our 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 soil, um, and uh, so so it requires a significant change in in, in dietary habits, and that's uh, being driven by Harvard uh, School of Public Health, in partnership with the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, they are currently. Uh, there's, if you go online and you look up menus of change, they currently have uh, a convention on their way. It's the eighth convention where virtually every corporate chef and, and uh, uh, chain man, restaurant chains and caterers and supply, supply chain representatives uh, are gathered to listen in on this. <clears throat> this year, they have really gone uh, uh, over the top in, in, in uh, explaining the urgent need you know, to shift our dietary practices. Um, yeah, so where to engage? And then just a couple of thoughts to, to finish this year. Um, there is a, a company, EcoTrust, is actually located in Portland, Oregon. Um, and we're one of the most progressive companies in the country, uh, nonprofits, and they have developed a report, a paper, uh, Agriculture of the Middle, and it defines a farmer who is too big for you know CSAs and farmers markets, but is too small to do contract farming for Walmart or Kroger or any of, of these big guys. So those are the, the farmers that are really struggling, but they are also the key to, to uh, a, a rejuvenation of the system. Um, you know, you have corporate commitments. Everyone has on their website statements of how important uh, local food is to them and how they are intending to do good things about it. But uh, in all reality, that is really not happening. So I just wanted to, to open up uh, uh, you know, a conversation starting with, with this you know, scenario uh, for, for what it is. The food supply is, is totally at risk. Um, the way we call our food is depleting the natural systems. Uh, and uh, the position that the large companies find themselves in, now my, my background is corporate. Now I've worked uh, as a director of food and beverage for the Walt Disney Company for 21 years and I designed these systems, um, fast food now. And then I worked uh, international uh, for a German wholesaler, uh, Metro Cash and Carry, and at the time they were in 30 countries. And my function was corporate head of target group marketing um, with teams in each country to develop segmentation strategies on what types of customers should we attract and support and what does it take to, to get to them. So um, the the... Uh, uh, the difficulty that, that the industry has to adapt and change is that they have been extremely successful in commoditizing food. Uh, so we, we, uh, we would source in these big restaurants practically everything coming from processing centers, which in turn uh, source from farmers, uh, 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 core products that are commodified, right? So they use the same seed, uh, the same animal everywhere uh, and, and overpower the natural systems by using synthetic nat nitrogen fertilizer, by uh, overpowering the natural nature with pesticides and insecticides and herbicides, basically. And so they can't get out of it because when you think about a company like McDonald's with 34,000 restaurants, they are completely locked in to this supply chain. They can't, there isn't a knife or a cutting board in the kitchen you know, to work with fresh food. And, and no one is trained to handle the fresh food. So the, the changes and adaptations that are required in the industry are very costly. You know, some of them may not make it. Uh, uh, it's the Kodak versus IBM. Uh, scenario playing out here. 
um, and that's so so that's sort of a top level uh, point so uh, from 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 a big picture you know as is so far so uh, what do you, what what comments do you have so far on that one I'm just stunned by the etymology of farm that Sahib just put in the chat. It comes from the fixed paint from leasing. I, I knew it was a farm. I knew it was like, that was like the origin, but it's from, it's from the lease. Seriously. That's so interesting. Um, and Doug can take us down the etymology of, of capital, which comes from caput or the head of cattle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and like the origins of, of the, the, the terms that we're kind of talking about here are really, really interesting. Um, Klaus, thank you for the for laying the, the table, uh, which is an ironic metaphor maybe at this moment in this conversation. Um, and I, I have two questions. You don't need to finish answering. I just want to put them on the table. Uh, but the first of them is, uh, have you found or is anybody tracking how much the needle has changed on changing behaviors for big ag, medium ag, little ag, uh, food habits, and so forth? Because if the needle has moved, you know, 1%, over the 40 years that I think this has been attempted, like, you know, uh, permaculture is quite, has been around for a long time. And we're, we're now in regenerative agriculture. And I think they're, you know, organic and other things are, are in between all efforts to try to get people to switch how food is raised and how food is eaten. Um, if they've only managed to make a 1% dent, we're kind of in, 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 real, in a world of hurt here. So is anybody tracking how much land is now uh, managed, you know, uh, outside of the old, old industrial sort of uh, farming paradigm, for example. Um, and then my other question is really at the opposite end entirely, which is we have a whole bunch of people for whom uh, buying the cheap calorie is almost the only way out because they live in a food desert because, because and these are all familiar issues, I think, to most of us. Um, and, and so much of this depends on pull, depends on demand, depends on, you know, people's habits and yeah. people's frame of mind. So uh, are those things being changed? So the market is in a sweet spot. Uh, the, the public is, is, is widely receptive. You know, one, one phenomena of the uh, uh, coronavirus is that your personal immunity system is practically the only defense you have. 92% of hospitalized cases from, from uh, COVID-19 have a pre-existing condition, you know, diabetes, heart disease, mm -hmm. and, you know, the 90, over 90%. So, so th th this is not being talked about much because of the implications, obviously, but people are becoming acutely aware of I'm on my own and I have to be healthy. So that, that, is, that is one core driver. Then we have been talking about health for a really long time, but the, the industry has unfortunately um, uh, con used their, their access to the information the channels, you know, media, advertising, and so on, to confuse the public um, and associate health and healthy eating, for example, with the Impossible Burger, with, with uh, you know, plant-based protein extracts and things of that sort, because that fits into their business model. They need a hamburger patty of some sort. No, they need a nugget, a chicken nugget or whatever. So they, they are transferring that from live animals into uh, a plant-based protein extract, but the, uh, these, pro these products test positive for glyphosate. So that means they, they are corn, they're, they're using commodity crops as a feedstock. So that's not the solution. You know, this is not going to restore soil. Um, and it's very difficult. So the, the, the way I see this is you have on the one hand, the producer, a lot of farmers are really starting to wake up and realize that their farm is at, their, their farm is at risk, their land is at risk. Landowners are starting to realize this. Now, if my soil is carbon depleted, that means uh, it is vulnerable to being washed out in rain. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's vulnerable to, to uh, go away. On the other hand, you have the consumer who, who is seeking information, seeking an understanding of what should I do and what can I afford to do. But in the middle, uh, you have uh, uh, the, the communication process between producer and consumer completely owned and controlled by, these, by this industrial uh, system. 
You know, when you think about billions of dollars they're spending on advertising to communicate with the consumer, it is very difficult to walk around this system and connect. And that's really the challenge at this point is to connect consumer to producer. And the only way to practically do this is at the local level, uh, uh, is at community level. Let me step out of the conversation for a second, see what everybody else thinks and where your interests are and uh, so forth. It looks like Tony's ready to jump in. Yeah, hi, a uh, question, I mean, what's, what's the purpose of uh, this effort? To come up with possible solutions or is that, or, uh, that at the basic level, what's the purpose of uh, this, these, these, this, excuse me, these discussions, Klaus? So I, I, see, I see some phenomenal business opportunities here for upstarts. There is so much innovation in the, in the market uh, with, with groups, and I, I posted one actually that just came across, you know, a, a group of three ladies who started up a company to advise on uh, uh, linking their menus and, and, and with, with, with the supply chain and so on. And so I see, um, I see phenomenal business opportunities to uh, bring uh, uh, fresh food and, and fresh food systems into low income populations. Because when you think about all the money that is being sucked out of low income groups, you know, they get, they get uh, SNAP money. So, you know, the federal government puts money in and then Walmart and Kroger pull it right back out. There isn't, it just doesn't stay in the community at all. So if that money coming in was being dispersed in local systems, you know, in, in uh, small scale businesses, it could start rolling and rejuvenate and revitalize uh, small communities. And, and my, my, my argument is this, this is not really possible to do in the nonprofit world. You know, you have to allow people to make a living uh, at, at doing what they want to do, but they still have to feed their families and, and pay rent. So, so I, th I think there is, there is a phenomenal way to uh, create business opportunities for, for folks who are, who are interested to go off on their own or who are seeking solutions. You know? So just to reiterate what you said, Klaus, what you're talking about is understanding things made, uh, systematically, maybe activities and how they all interrelate. Then from that, identify problems that can be solved. And then from that, to capitalize on the identified problems by, uh, uh, you mentioned startups or something like that. Yeah, I, I was, when I, when I first retired, you know, I was still in this corporate mindset of uh, flying to China, to Russia, to Turkey, and working with my team to figure out what should they be doing locally and so on. And there was a design challenge from the AARP, you know, the American Association of Retired People. And it was elimination of food deserts. So I had totally my corporate head on and I had no idea what was a food desert. You know, I mean, never heard of it. And so I wrote you know, a, a plan, which is the typical plan that I would present you not know, in my company that I worked for. So, um, and, and I developed the idea of a soft franchise system. See, a franchise system is basically um, consolidating the, the know-how about how to run a business. So when you go look at Panda Express or you look at you know, any of these uh, companies, the, the franchise system capsul encapsulates everything you need to know to get yourself set up and up and, up and running. And I developed a soft franchise approach for the company I was working for, for Metro Cash and Carry, because we were competing in Eastern Europe at the time. I mean, uh, we had three regions, Asia, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. And in Eastern Europe, we, had, we got penetrated by uh, uh, Burger King and McDonald's and Starbucks, and we started to lose market share because we were uh, specialized to work with small traders and small restaurants and basically independent family operations. So we developed this soft franchise uh, idea where, for example, we had Ryoba Coffee to compete against Starbucks. So we provided you know, a graphics package, uh, all the equipment you need, um, all the products that you would need to have a sophisticated uh, coffee house. And we, we uh, pitched that throughout Eastern Europe, you know, Russia, you know, Romania, I mean, Bulgaria. And it was very successful. So we developed several concepts like this called a soft franchise. So my thought was, 
that uh, uh, you, you, need, you need an anchor in the community that works as a broker. You know, is a, what is missing is the brokerage function to connect market participants. You know, and, and I thought that is where for us, you know, OTM could be a business opportunity to provide the intellectual foundation you know, for, um, for a business on how to, to set that up. You know, that's so, it. Yeah, um, thank you. And, and Tony, you probably have more you want to say about this. I was thinking that your question would be a really good question to pose to everybody who's on the call who'd like to answer it. Uh, because I think that our ideas about how to tackle the problems in the system might be a bit different and our different perspectives on it would be really useful to get on the table because I, I, you know, we've just learned what Klaus is looking at and I've never heard of soft franchises, which sound really interesting, but I, I'm willing to bet that, that Judy and Sahib and Doug uh, and Tony, you have sort of slightly different perspectives on it. So I'd love to ask your question of, of you and, and of everybody. So Tony, do you want to jump back in? I'm sorry, did you say me? Uh, yes. Uh, I was, okay, I just, uh, again, I, I got a background in system, systems thinking. I'm just saying, okay, what's the system we're thinking about here? I mean, uh, the, the, if I wrote down regenerative soil, regenerate soil, carbon replenishment is, is the overall system that we're going to, to be looked at to find out, identify problems, then to identify opportunities. But there was also mentioned potential other things out of, in a different scope, such as better eating habits and stuff like that. So is the effort here to limited to just soil regeneration? I, th I think we're looking at this as a very intertwined system where uh, really, you know, sharp changes in any of these angles like eating habits would would have a lot of backward sort of upstream effects on how farmers farm and what's going on and maybe also major changes in farming and agriculture could change eating but you know like where do we where do we tug on the system is part of what we're i think we're asking um, and, and Klaus is suggesting a, a commercial framework for setting people up quickly and, and easily into business that might tip some of those places right i think that's part of the, the soft franchise concept um, so let's go, uh, let's go around uh, to Judy next. You're muted. I should just leave my cursor sitting there so I can mute and unmute easily. Um, I guess I'm thinking about this from a couple of different angles. One is that pushing products to market is hard. Getting products pulled to market is the way companies choose to go. And so the, the best opportunity, although it's not the easiest to tackle, is attempting to persuade consumers to change their habits. And there are a variety of approaches that could be used, but it needs to be a combination of health and economics. Because right now it's expensive to eat healthy. Right. And that's a problem for the consumer, which is what led to part of the practices that are depleting the resources. So it's expensive. yeah, sorry. Go ahead. It's Wait. expensive to eat healthy if you're going to have beef and lobster uh, and the way too cheap pork and chicken or whatever. But it, but if you go like veg, which few people want to do these days, because as people come into the middle class, what they want is more more animal products, right? So right. no, so, I, yeah. I think that that the economics of vegetarianism is an educational opportunity. Yeah. Because you yeah. can buy 25 pounds of soybeans, and get all the protein you would need <laughs> in a variety of useful ways, changing it into textures that resemble ground meat and other things. Um, but there's a learning curve there. And it's yeah. also not facilitated. I mean, it's cheap to buy bulk soybeans. Texturized soy is a different matter. <laughs> yeah. And so there's a, there's a learning curve there of how would you begin to shift the public and is COVID and the danger of poor health a sufficiently big club that we have a unique opportunity to assist that change in the consumer? Right. So um, part of this discussion, I think, could break off into more effective ways to influence consumer purchasing, which is what ultimately influences economics of doing things. Because if the consumers aren't buying what you've been doing, you either go out of business or you change what you're doing. <laughs> right, right. And there's an argument, there's an argument that- The argument right now in terms of the whole economy in general 
because consumers are not buying other consumer products that are not food related either. And so it's threatening many different business models. Um, so I, I, I'm just, that's, so that's one particular angle. The other one that I'm actually interested in is how do we make better policy changes that can influence and, and drive some of the necessary changes for survival? And that's a whole different arena. You know, do you start local? Do you work on community, which work their way up to state? Do you start trying to influence national or international? What are those bodies? And the national international kind of looks at OGB as a resource or could be, we could be positioned as a resource. So those are sort of two extremes of what I think would be viable pressure points. Cool, thank you, Judy. Uh, Sahib, do you want to jump in? Or Doug, I think you just unmuted. You have your hands up and you're unmuted. So uh, let's go Doug then Sahib. Okay, uh, I want to approach this at the strategic level with a bit of a shift, which reflects my own thinking. Uh, we divide farming off from the rest of life. So it occurs in kind of special uh, domains that tend to have a fence around them with no people inside. I think it's a lot easier to solve problems sometimes if you make them larger. So my view is if we put the growth of food and the need for shelter and the need for culture into the same project, I think we might make more success. Uh, certainly uh, the issue of shelter, where people live and how they live is gonna be crucial in this society as we cut down energy use. So why not put uh, shelter where people live in the middle of where the, the food has grown. Uh, there's many advantages to that and it begins to be a culture of meaning that can actually engage everybody in a new kind of project. Uh, we live in a divide and, and, uh, and uh, conquer society and uh, I think we need to put the pieces back together again to cope with this crisis that we're in and going through. Thanks, Doug. Um, and and I, I think that our different sort of flashlights into the big hairball of issues here are, are super, super interesting. Um, Let me be, well, before you go to Sahib, I want to introduce him to the oh, group. Cool. Uh, Sahib and We've I have been before. working together. Uh, he's at the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, a, a good friend, and uh, he can speak for himself. Thanks, Doug, and great to see you, Jerry, and a lot of new faces also. Um, I apologize, actually, the last, like, several minutes, I think right when you, Jerry, you asked Klaus that question, I was sort of scatterbrained trying to get out a proposal, but um, let me jump in on this, on this sort of last part that Doug is talking about, about looking at these issues together. I mean, I think two things stand out to me is a series of questions about what has to shift if we're looking at culture, shelter, food together, and then maybe a thing to start with. And that is thinking about the questions of what do we attend to and what do we now, uh, you know, what do we now ignore? What becomes important? What becomes obsolete? What do we need to actually get rid of? What do we need to keep? What do we need to continue the way it is already? What do we need to repurpose? Um, and I ask this question because, uh, you know, even uh, hearing your suggestion, Judith, about policy changes, it strikes me that without a sort of rigorous set of ethics or an understanding of what ethics should be, it's really hard to make uh, policy uh, recommendations or changes you know, that uh, baked within them have a sense of values and assumptions about uh, what ethics are. Um, and then I think building on Doug's great point about considering shelter and food, you know, habitat, how we live, the space we're in, how we relate to each other all together. So that's just can, a- Can I comment on something? I really like what you're saying, Doug, about the community-based approach and the proximity to consumption and a bunch of things that change transportation, logistics, a whole bunch of things. A complexity of that is healthcare delivery because the decentralization to local communities of healthcare delivery has become very ineffective given the move to urbanization and central locations of sophisticated healthcare. So 
I just want to comment that that's, you know, I'd love to live in a small community, but at this stage of my life, being closer to a medical community is also a consideration. And so that's a factor yeah. that would have to be thought into the strategy of how we enable that. And maybe it's telemedicine. There's, there's a bunch of things. I just want to kind of table the notion that mm -hmm. if you're going to look at different community models, which I really favor because people can form communities, they can affect what they're doing, they shorten the supply chain. There's just so many benefits. We just need to take a broad look at that in terms of other implications. Thanks, Judy. Um, and Rob is also writing a proposal, so he's got an ear in the conversation, but I'm, Rob, unmute yourself if you'd like to jump in. Otherwise, I would, I would love to share sort of my perspective on this as well. Um, cool, thanks. Uh, so I'll just type in what I'm about to say for a second. Um, my own take on this is that this is a really tangly system. It's a lovely systems mess. I wish Gene Bellinger were here so he could share <clears throat> the, the Kumu diagram that he did that unfolds that talks about, you know, food system interdependencies and how things work. But that would take like an hour to get through just to understand the systems diagram where I think that, you know, we're having the conversation because we have each of us a pretty good perspective on it. Uh, but, but for me, um, I studied a bit under Russell Acoff, um, uh, at Wharton, and he was one of the original systems thinkers. And one of the things he said was, <clears throat> one of his early, the early lecture points he would make is that there's kind of no such thing as a problem. And he used to be the head of the Operations Research Society in America. And uh, sorry, he was, he was an operations researcher from World War II and was offered the presidency of the International Society of OR. And he rejected it and wrote a f a one or two famous essays <clears throat> in the journal that said the future of OR is past because they had become a tools oriented discipline that had multiple regression, linear programming, queuing theory, Monte Carlo, whatever. And they were looking at problems in the world collecting data, optimizing a solution, plugging that back in and hoping to fix the problem. And he says the French have a word problematique, which means systems of problems. And kind of what you need to do is a little bit everywhere. And so, and so <clears throat> that informed me a lot in that, in that to, to shift problems as thorny and pervasive as this one, where different levels of the system are reinforced, mutually reinforcing a dysfunctional setup altogether. So food habits are reinforcing, the economic structures are reinforcing, the, the current uh, you know, farming habits are reinforcing the market uh, rewards and pricing mechanisms are rewarding policy issues that were determined a really long time ago. And I put in the chat that, that Richard Nixon wanted cheap food so that the poor people wouldn't rise up. So he told Earl Butts, make, make corn and make, make calories really cheap. And Butts went out and did that policy-wise. And we're still basically suffering from that. Oh, cool. Um, so... So then my, the other angle I look at this through is uh, a, a guy named Milton Erickson, who was a therapist uh, who had polio back in the depression and ended up using hypnosis to try to address people's unconscious. I say all of this about Milton because his magic was suggesting to your unconscious a new option that you would then be like, oh, okay, next time I'm approaching a bridge because I have this phobia about bridges, I'm actually going to pull over and take a couple of deep breaths. That is a new uh, behavior in my repertory that will cure me from just freaking out as I cross the bridge and maybe like crashing or something. Um, how do we do that at a cultural level through stories, through whatever? And Klaus showed us a really nice animation video ab about the problems in the food system and then his presentation about the problems in the food system, which I agree with, which I see, and which apparently some, a, a whole large crew in the population it's not getting to them. They don't believe it. They whatever. So what is the tiny shift? What is the little bit of collective hypnosis that comes out of storytelling that we could get to that would tip any of these different sort of big system levers? Because I think that pull is easier than push. So if we can shift demand, if people say, <coughs> if people start saying the hell with steaks, um, you know, I would like this or that. I think that's really interesting to complicate matters science is kind of running against natural farming a lot. So this idea of beyond meat and just, you know, we're just going to craft nutrients. And if you read any Michael Pollan, he's like, eat food, don't eat nutrients. Nutrients aren't food. They're not arranged like food. They don't process like food. And I'm conflicted about this because if we manage to create artificial beef, pork, whatever, <clears throat> uh, without killing animals, that would be fabulous. And if 30 years down the road, um, citizens of the world are like, do you remember that time when we used to actually raise and kill large numbers of animals to eat them? Like, doesn't that sound crazy? 
that would be a great future to have, right? And, and by the way, peak course was around 1910, I think. Uh, either 1910 or 1919, I'm forgetting. But remember, horses were transportation until the car. And so peak horse matches with the, the advent of the car, which creates its own problems. So, so trying to work the way around this. And then from the OGM perspective on this hairball, um, I'm really interested in how do we amplify any of those messages? How do we assess the system better? How do we give people tools to tell the story locally better over and over again? But how do we simplify the messages so that everybody doesn't have to understand the whole hairball to just know what to do that's right for their spot on earth? And, and sort of connect into what to do. And, and to me, the reason I was excited about, about setting up this call in the first place is that soil fertility to me is one of those little magnets where people, most people don't know, but if you sort of say, hey, focus on soil organic matter. And if we gave everybody a soil organic matter meter, you know, so, some way to test for, for SOM uh, over and over again, and then s send that into a, a, a database and say, hey, I did a little bit better here and use nudge kind of you know, uh, behavioral economics to help farmers do this, that might be a little break, breakthrough. But small other next story, I visited Jumping Frog Farms in, uh, up in Marin, uh, north of Marin, and um, they were a, a really delightful, delightful sort of permaculture regenerative farm, only a couple acres making lots of food. All of their neighbors were conventional farmers. And it dawns on me that they have made enemies of the local dude who sells fertilizer and the local dude who sells pesticides and the local John Deere harvester lease guy who wants to rope you into a contract where you can't even fix the tractor and you don't own the data it's collecting on your farm. There's this, there's this ne never mind, don't even provoke me to talk about Monsanto now owned by Bayer and their monopoly on seeds and Terminator and all that kind of stuff. So, so to go to jump over the river into this new world of regenerative ag, which sequesters carbon, which has all these, all these virtues that actually creates nutrients, it creates a lot of food off a little bit of land, et cetera, et cetera, means, means making enemies of your neighbors unless we can crack that code. So to me, one of the really interesting places to push is to help people make new friends or to, create, to think about the social dynamics of these shifts. Everything from the dinner table with neighbors and making it okay to not serve a steak or a roast beef or something like that, all the way back to uh, the, any farmer or um, rancher who's thinking about you know, the land. Uh, and, and so if we can kind of tip multiple parts of that and also affect the policy level that Judy was talking about, we stand a small chance of shifting the needle a lot. But, but to me, any small effort, a really great effort at one lever isn't going to tip the system. This is like many people have to work at many levers, kind of grinding away over time to build relationships, build trust, make the science work, uh, all those kinds of things. Sorry for the long spiel, but, but you know, I've been perking on this for a while. I put the nexus for these topics in my brain in the chat. Uh, and I'm happy to go to Doug and then turn it back to Klaus because we've just eaten a bunch of our time in the call, but I think we put a lot of interesting uh, things on the table. So Doug. Okay, I think that we're in a crisis of, uh, that's pretty huge. And what's likely to happen will be breakdowns in the supply chain that bring us food. So what you're gonna find is the Safeway truck does not show up tomorrow and everybody gets really exercised and they meet out in the street and start talking about what the hell are they gonna do. Uh, I think that's the way it's gonna happen. I don't think it's gonna come from policy and ideas to action. It's gonna go from action to looking for policies that might work. So it'll be pragmatic responses to crisis that are gonna drive most of the change, which, that's, which, yeah. presents, which presents an interesting other approach, which is, if you leave things at hand for those moments of crisis so that the best path forward is one that fits the solutions to the global problem, that could be really useful. So, so you know, uh, I think it was Klaus or someone else on one of the calls recently was like, I think, yeah, Klaus, I'm pretty sure it was you. Uh, California is on fire. It creates, uh, you know, most of our, our, our veggies. Uh, the Gulf is just being like selenized because the, you know, the, the, the weather's going to, the, the ocean, the Gulf water is going to come in and, and change the crops there. We have all, all these different sort of moments of crop failure happening already. 
um, and it's probably going to get worse. And never mind that Australia has been on fire and, and so forth. So, uh, so how does crisis precipitate this? Yeah. I say a word about, to Judith about the health issue. Uh, I imagine something like barefoot doctors. That is, we have local people trained in uh, basic health care. And that what you have is a system then of moving upscale uh, towards the central hospital for those who need it. Uh, I saw that working in Mexico pretty well in the 60s. Uh, it's an attractive way to approach the issue. And that everybody should have some basic uh, health education in terms of being a provider, not just a consumer. Uh, two just, tiny things to that and then to Saeed. Uh, in Cuba, um, uh, your typical building block has a flat that is a clinic, which makes complete and total sense, like, like utter and complete sense. Like just, just take an apartment and make it a clinic so that everybody has a place to go for the, stu the, the broken foot, the whatever, whatever, and then, and then off to hospital for other things. Cuba has plenty of other issues around it, but they have great healthcare outcomes. And then Brad Templeton was just posting about how he thinks ambulances are going to be the first things that turn into air taxis because <clears throat> it just makes so much sense. You, you, you don't have to worry about traffic. You're, uh, you know, nobody's going to argue about the noise created by an air ambulance because it's urgent, et cetera, et cetera. So two tiny things. Sorry, Sahib, go ahead. And I, just then, and bring, then I just wanted to bring in a, a sort of personal anecdote, and this comes from uh, actually my great grandmother used to host women's circles. This is back in Punjab in rural India. And basically you had uh, Sufis, Hindus, six, 40 women. We're talking 1920s, 30s, 40s, right before partition, uh, who would get together one hour a day, every day. And these were m women who basically said, hey, I have four kids, or I just got married and had four kids, but don't, didn't mean to. Or I just got married into this family with all these expectations, what do I do? And many of them didn't actually have a way to both, some of them didn't know how to cook, some of them couldn't, you know, many of them couldn't afford food. But what I think is powerful about that is each of those women were tied to, they were coming in, the sort of structure was, you were coming in needy and we'll leave as pillars whenever you would like. And the sort of metaphor is being a, a sort of lotus flower that is, you know, creating the conditions around you, you know, within and then around whatever context you're in. So should the, con should the surroundings want to thrive and be abundant, they're able to. They don't have to, but should they want to, they're able. And so what I think is powerful about that example is it's a sort of networking of resources. So, you know, people who couldn't get in line to get wheat you know, there were three or four other women who would perhaps make something and offer something uh, to, to a family. Now, how that infrastructure would be set up, it's of course, you know, um, it's not just highly localized, it's also spread out. But what's interesting is that think of 40 women, their local networks, where they go back to, and then creating these kinds of structures within those networks to be able to support each other in other ways. Um, I mean, it's, I can attest to it that was, you know, I wasn't around, but 35, 40 years of it, uh, you know, over 600 women, uh, you know, who came through, who shifted, but it's a different kind of local model, you know, to build on, I think, some of the points you were making, Judith, about locality and how does that work? Hmm. Yeah, so the conversation, I'm sorry. I, would, I, I just wanted to comment that I think the notion that you're raising, Sahib, in terms of the networking and community is a powerful one that's available right now for a lot of reasons. And it's cheap. And it's cheap. It's I also crazy. think that, that in some communities, one of the members of that circle would be a healer of one sort or another. It's, it's just part of what happens in groups because there are individuals with healing personalities and or healing skills. And I think if, yeah. if that person in old days, they might have been called a midwife, they might have been called a naturalist, an herbalist, whatever the terms were. But I think some of those constructs might be good to sort of keep in the back of our thought process in terms of how do you enable those, because they then become a dissemination point. Mm -hmm. Let me just build on one really quick and we'll go to Klaus. And that is, you know, I think my great grandmother saw herself as a sort of Socratic facilitator but people who are coming into those circles were all sort of recognizing what are the roles that need to be played and need to, need to contribute. And they might, have been, they might be roles that they weren't even recognizing they already play, 
or could be playing. Um, and so to your point about, uh, you know, uh, healers or naturalists, um, you know, those kind of specialties, but also just a, an interest in contributing those roles developed uh, sort of organically through the bonds in the network. So love that. You're describing the dynamic I'm trying to create in OGM. Mm -hmm. uh, Klaus, <laughs> the, floor, the floor is so, completely yours. So what, what, what we're basically um, surfacing here is the need to have a highly decentralized system that creates enormous flexibility at ground level, um, but follows a structure that guides it into the right direction, right? So, I mean, listening in on, on the conversation, what comes to mind, for example, is the Israeli kibbutz, right? So after World War II, you had some of the smartest people in the world be found themselves in a, in a piece of desert land uh, fighting for their survival and the first thing was we need to have something to eat and they were able to recreate I mean to create an enormous system of uh, cell of food independence in a very short period of time by uh, creating community sort of a co-op type of thing but may maybe if, if you allow me I'll take the screen one more time and I'll share um, this this uh, soft franchise thing that I was uh, working on you now actually a really long time ago now. So you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So here is, uh, you can see it's September 2012, right? <laughs> and, and I apologize, this is like uh, this is September 2012 uh, thought status, right? I mean, so it's a while ago. But so I'm, I'm explaining here, you know, and, and this was driven by the American Association of Retired Peoples uh, and, and, fo and food, des uh, food deserts. And I was just like shocked that there is such a thing as a food desert because I came to the United States in 1976 and I had never experienced a shortage of food, but it's clearly there. So I, I can put this online later. I don't want to go through all the... Uh, um, reasonings here, but uh, a large number of citizens have limited or no access to fresh, nutritionally sound food. You know, the supply chain in the US, US is highly specialized around multi-unit, multi-market corporations. Retailers are vertically integrated into the supply chain or in partnership with large producers. So, that, so I, I, I defined the system as I saw it. You now, at that time, my job was to do country audits. So I would go to uh, Spain, you know, and, and audited how the wholesale markets are organized in Spain or in China or in India or in, in you know, we were in 30 countries. And so, so I, I looked at the American food systems through that lens because I was still hyperactive, you know, in, in this mindset. Um, and so what I, what I saw was the limitations and the lockdown in the US system that made it really difficult for my company that I worked for, for example, it would have been extremely difficult to break into this market. So, so what is the challenge? Now, small to medium-sized farms and food processors need open and un unrestricted access to markets in order to optimize their operations. Now, they benefit from crop rotation, following the seasons with appropriate products, complementary animal husbandry, you know, food processors can optimize their yields by creating complementary high value recipes. I mean, in Germany, for example, or anywhere in, in Europe, you have thousands of small abattoirs. Every village has their small, has their local butcher, you know? and every farmer has a few animals. And it's policy here that makes that impossible. So um, a polyface farm, for example, raises chickens, which they can slaughter. They also raise cattle, which they cannot slaughter because of inspection requirements and a bunch of other stuff. So they must ship them off to other facilities. So, so part of this is a, is a policy slice. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah, they, they, are, they are real. The market is completely uh, controlled and the farm bill is a, is a, no, a disaster. Oh my God, yes. The farm so bill I'm is saying here, so the target consumer needs access to distribution points, retail outlets that are within easy reach, which operate at low cost. The food supply chain should operate, operate under local with limited transportation, no more than two to three steps between farm and consumer, extremely flexible to deal with seasonal and weather influence fluctuations and so on. So then I'm, I'm 
coming up here is this soft franchise idea, you know, develop a partnership with regional food hubs to act as distribution centers to local retailers. And I discovered at the time there is, there is a thing like food hubs, the Wallace Center has a national support structure in place for food hubs. And I actually helped someone set up a food hub in, I mean, I was living in Palm Desert uh, in, in Coachella Valley. And I worked here in Bend, and so, so I tried to engage. And I realized, you know, this this nonprofit world operates on a different ticker. You know, that just uh, it just doesn't work. I mean, the average food hub has less than a million dollars in sales you now. And uh, even here, trying to get these guys to think commercial and to think uh, in revenue generating, uh, broadening uh, ideas, it you know, it just doesn't work. It has to be. It, it has to be focused on a for-profit uh, uh, environment, people wanting to make a living and, 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 and being ambitious about it. You know? um, so, uh, uh, but, but the, the, what they do need uh, is uh, establish a small business support center as part of or attached to the regional food hub to assist local community business development, business plans, startup microfinancing, support with facility design, equipment planning, recommended list of contractors, federal, state, local licensing requirements. Very practical, hands-on issues that need to be solved in order to even have a local small business of any sort. So, um, so then I'm saying food hubs. Now I'm, I'm beyond food hubs at this point, but there has to be uh, a catalyst you know, who uh, who, who supports this development of, of local markets there. So I came up with this idea here where you have in the center, you know, in the center here, um, uh, sort of a, 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 a consolidating umbrella uh, uh, function that, that uh, uh, consolidates the local market uh, by uh, uh, special support structures. What are the food sources? You know, what are the food retail formations that are possible? You know, what are operation support services, customer intelligence, marketing support, centralized promotion, concept guidance and training, operational control support, and on the other side, business development services, market segmentation, identification, most appropriate retail options, business plans, and so on and so on. So that's from a very practical perspective, um, that could be a dozen different companies doing these things, but they just need to have a consolidating structure, you know, so they all work on the same on the same outcome. Yeah, and so then you now I come in here with regional food hubs. The, you know, there is a big support structure in place. Never went anywhere. I mean, this is. This had so much potential in the USDA to their credit. They're really uh, uh, funding this, put pumping money into it, and it turned into a bunch of uh, 501c3s uh, making a living. Yes, Doug. I think Doug has, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, uh, Klaus, what do you think of including where people live in the idea of the hub? So, yeah, excellent. Um, what I'm thinking is that uh, you would have um, a, a uh, uh, let's say, a national level uh, uh, think tank that sponsors the development, and this is the idea of soft franchise. So, if someone local comes up and he goes, "I want to do, um, I want to do brokerage between food sourcing and food retailers." And we can say, well, go for it. Here's how you have to set yourself up. Here's a business plan. Here are your licensing requirements. Here's what you, uh, uh, we, here are funding sources that may help you to get started. Um, can you uh, unshare so we can see each other? Um, Sorry. Yeah. But that's okay. Um, so a, a couple thoughts sort of quickly. Um, first thought is really like sort of pragmatic from the OMG perspective. I just typed my notes in my in the chat. So it's like from the OGM perspective, like, oh my God, your, your really good ideas are trapped in a PDF or a PowerPoint or whatever, which is a PDF from the, the geek in me is like where information goes to die. Um, so 
part of me is looking at this going, why is, why, why is each of your bullet points not out in the medium that we use to communicate and remember what we've agreed to know and all of that? So when you say that there are food deserts, like I, I also shared the node to food deserts in my brain, and it's just my brain, damn it. It's just me sort of curating this. It's as obscure as a PDF right now, but the goal of OGM is to make this part of our ongoing conversation and memory. And then these points wouldn't be novel to everybody. We'd be like raised improving the points that you're making. And we would, we would then not have to sort of bootstrap our way into the conversation. We would be in the conversation as, as part of how we live. So that's one thing. <clears throat> um, a second thing is my own, my own strategy about development has really shifted dramatically. It's tell stories and then ask how you can help. And, the story, and, and, and also leave resources at hand, which I think is where soft franchising comes in. Um, but, but everything must be picked up and adapted to local circumstances. So what Doug says about, about you know, the location is primary. Like the humans and where they are, uh, and they might get shoved off their land, that's, that's going to happen with climate crises, it's, it's happening a lot, you know, in, in a lot of ways. But the humans and where they are sort of are, are the drivers. And if they are not interested and if they don't feel like they made this or built this, none of this happens. So we could create a policy measure that says, let's put food hubs everywhere and the USDA could back it nicely. And I don't know the story behind food hubs. I'm really interested in figuring out why it didn't work. I'm suspecting that the food industry didn't want it to work. So they managed to throw like sabots in the works. <clears throat> Does everybody know that the etymology of sabotage? Uh, World War I, a lot of peasants were put to work in factories. They took their wooden shoes called sabots and threw them in the machine. So it's sabotage. <clears throat> um, so, so, so I think that the, a bottom-up approach and the business plans and all the structures you've just described, which are your version of an optimal set of solutions, could be instantiated as software that are available as a service to whoever wants to pick up and build one of your soft franchises, right? And so, so to me, um, and then I say ask how to help because uh, I just listened to a really good TEDx talk where um, the woman basically says, look, I, you know, I've been seeing all these projects around the world. We decided that our, our approach was going to be to approach locals and say, what do you need? And to not try to foist on them. This is what all development agencies do is we have done a whole bunch of studies. We found best practices on this. Just do this and everything will be okay. And it turns out that that's just simply broken and it's been broken forever that we need, people need to go, oh, here's a better way to do it and here's what I can do and then appropriate other people's wisdom. They're perfectly open to insights somebody else had. Like that village seems to be really prosperous. Oh, it's because this person has been making a market in, in whatever they're doing, let's use that. And then, and then they pick up and go and, 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 and use it. So, um, and then I, uh, you know, and then I added, but crises. So all of this would be great in normal times, except everybody's gonna be whacked over the head through shortages, crises, fires, floods, <clears throat> whatever. So, so I think that modifies the plan in the sense of emergency kits, soft franchises disguised as emergency kits. Does that make sense? Because yeah. in, an emer in an emergency, you're gonna try to reach out for what's going to fix our problem right now. And if that, if that fix is actually high capacity, and, and here I'll go to a different idea. I was talking to a fellow who does a lot of work in refugees. And I'm like, why don't we let refugees be first class citizens? immediately, hand them a tablet, give them an ID, uh, a, a, an ID that can't be rubbed off their person, off their person and let them accrue, um, I took this course. So that certificate attaches to my ID, can't be removed from me. And, and, and we can offer like, you know, the Google suite is free to use and it's like world-class word processing spreadsheets and everything else. Why can't we treat refugees like first-class human beings and let them ladder up out of refugeeness, right? And then uh, I, I wrote in here democracy corners because I had a tiny idea <clears throat> years ago. I was working with the uh, National Coalition for, no, it was the Deliberative Democracy Consortium. And I suggested to them that they create a template on the web where anybody could go take a corner of their cafeteria, take a PC, because this is in the days of heavy PCs, lock it to a table, tape off, take some pretty tape and mask off the wall so it looks like a booth, like a kiosk, and just point the homepage of that PC to a page about deliberative democracy and what it means. And this would be a deliberative democracy corner that anybody could pay for and instantiate and maintain on their premises. So no, no money spent by the DDC, only for, for creating the blueprint, the outline for how this thing replicates. And then people could just walk, walk past, walk up, 
go do it, send themselves a link to the page, go learn. It would just, it's just another way to reach people. And then finally, I said virtualize and decentralize because again, I think that making all these resources available virtually means anybody can reach them who wants them. The problem is they don't want them right now. And decentralized means let's, let's not forget about policy because it drives everything so much, but let's try to do this where people are, uh, you know, bringing resources up. Sorry for the long, the long thing again, <clears throat> but I'm trying to piece together how change happens and how we might make that work better. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, an opportunity that might be presenting itself is the long lines that are being established at food distribution centers. Yeah. If we could come up with a way of reorganizing those lines. So for example, instead of the division between the people passing out the food and the people receiving it, that people could move out of the line and become workers in the system. And you'd have a flexible back and forth between the length of the lines and the people. Uh, it seems to me like the kind of thing that a systems thinker uh, ought to really be attracted to because it's almost, uh, I mean, it's just a good way to think. Um, tiny side story. My first job in the world was at Disney on the Jungle Cruise. And occasionally you had to go do other duty. But one of the big things at Disney is line control. And so <clears throat> on the Jungle Cruise, every 15 minutes you would change positions. You would go take tickets, you would go in the boat, you would take tickets, and then you'd go on break and you'd basically rotate that all day. Um, and managing the line was a really big deal because people get bored out of their skulls and Disney has, has evolved some technology around that. But truly, when you're in line, you could be learning something, you could be helping others, like you just said, Doug, you could be doing a million, like <clears throat> waiting for service doesn't need to be waiting for service, right? <clears throat> and so how, how do we do that? And and if they're in cars in a line, they've all got a radio in their car. So you could say, you could put up a sign that says, hey, tune to AM 2220 <clears throat> and start there. And if you've got a smartphone, then go to this website and start doing this. And if you're interested and you have an hour, you can step out and get sanitized and then start doing this. All of that's virtually doable. Yep. All of that's virtually doable. I, 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 like that would be really cool. And, and Klaus, they could ladder up to the soft franchise idea. Well, the, I mean, for the last few years, I've been uh, doing this volunteer work, um, you know, and I'm you know, working national level with, with several NGOs. I mean, I'm a core team member you know, of Sierra Club, political action committee and all of these things. And uh, it, with citizen climate lobby, lobby, we have direct access to the two members of Congress. You know, we have a full-time lobbyist and I get to uh, you know, comment on legislation and uh, provide input and so on. But what I found is there are good examples for, for everything. So um, there are so many innovators out there. If you could pull these guys in and say, look, you're doing a great job. How about you share what you know and let us help you structure uh, you know, what you're doing so that you can, you can then roll that to other communities which have an equal problem, have an equal have a like type scenario that you have already solved, right? So this, this rolling out of best practice cases, you know, I mean, that could, be, that could be an initiative, you know, it, because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, I'm literally anything that you're looking for, you go online, somebody has done it already, has solved it already. Yeah. So here's the problem, I think, is intellectual property, what people's ideas about IP. Uh, so Paul Stamets is like the mushroom magician. My problem with Paul Stamets is that he wants to patent everything and lock away what he knows so that he can make a lot of money from the businesses that grew up around mushrooms. <clears throat> and I'm like, God damn it. If we could convince Paul Stamets to open source all his ideas and we could just go build this everywhere, we could do remediation. We could do new foods. We could do packaging. We could do a whole bunch of stuff, except Paul is busy like in the middle of this hoarding his ideas, right? So I think he's a genius but hoarding his ideas. And but there's, the someone, there's someone there who also does it, and who just isn't as sophisticated as Paul, but mm -hmm. he's working open source. He doesn't even know the difference. So why not, why not grab that guy? And that would be great if Paul doesn't sue him and sort of lock up the whole thing. But, but yes, uh, and so I think part of this is who's willing to share and, and how do we build systems where when people share their ideas freely, they still benefit really well without locking away the IP. 
And so, so there has to be a revenue producing model that is associated with that. Of some sort, yeah. And, and maybe that's, we, we, you know, we find a pool of money and we nominate these people as fellows and the money they get is from a large pool of funding fellows, which is something we'd love to do in OGM. Um, but, the, but the government or an NGO or something like that could just say, hey, um, for sharing your ideas, you're gonna get this much per whatever and it's just gonna come from some central pool. It doesn't have to come from locking away the information and metering it out like sticks of bubble gum. So there, there is huge money out there waiting, waiting to, to find a place to invest. And I right. posted actually one group, I was attending a webinar uh, last week and I posted it on OGM in my introduction there somewhere. Um, I can probably not, um, yeah, it's the Corton Institute. Um, and, and so they, they have consolidated funders looking for opportunities to invest in community development, in, in regenerative agriculture, um, constructing clean portfolios for climate solutions. Now, so we, be, cool. we could become brokers between these funding sources and uh, identifying worthwhile projects. I mean, this could be yeah. one opportunity. Yeah. Sounds, uh, so for me, and I apologize, I have to leave in about five because I have a, an important call at the half that I have to join and I need a couple minutes transition between the two. Um, I can also leave this room open because that call is not in this room and you guys can talk until you're done. Uh, the, part of the reason we're having this huge schism in the country is that uh, apparently a, a more than 40% of, of the population of America, maybe 50% of it, I don't know, I'm scared right now, believes that our systems, including NGOs and everybody trying to help is completely broken and they're not getting any help. So whatever has been happening for a really long time is simply not ha happening, is, is not, not helping enough people. <clears throat> and that's partly why my brain is flipping to tell a lot of stories, leave open resources at hand, ask how you might be able to help and don't force anybody to do anything. Um, that, that, that's sort of an approach where the bureaucracy can't really destroy that. Uh, it's bottom up, it picks up. And then planning kind of the, I'm gonna call it the user journey. I hate that term so much, but, but seeing how people can ladder up through that and, and, and build larger networks and larger collectives and jump into larger scale businesses and do more stuff, sounds great. Um, but, but how to intervene, I think here is really, is really, really puzzling because well-funded NGOs and well-intentioned NGOs have somehow not cracked the case right. and government agencies haven't cracked the case. And there, there's half the country has suspicion about all those entities, all of them, <clears throat> because their local, their situation on the ground is worse than it was. And it's worse because liberals bought the neo the, the neoliberal agenda and decided it was okay to let companies ship their jobs overseas and then not do anything about the workers than about the, the cities. And so there's a whole book, there's like a hollowed out middle of America that's like out of work. And they're like, nobody seems to have given a damn about what we do. <clears throat> uh, the financial system has said it's okay to you know, like gut somebody's retirement program and uh, sell off all their assets and hedge funds go to it. Uh, you know, you hedge fund billionaires are, are our heroes when in fact they've been gutting America and, and leaving little husks that, that, that barely can stay alive out there on the landscape. And so all of these things are contributing to our problem. Never mind it, overprotection of intellectual property, never mind all these things. So I'm trying to figure out how to subvert the system. <clears throat> how, do we, how do we tip it so that we give insane power to the fingertips, let them make better decisions that, have, that, that help them, that, that orient in the right direction. So the, the challenge is to find revenue producing models um, that may come through funding from an organization like the Corton Institute or through direct payments um, and, uh, and, and develop a structure, you know, that, that, that where brokerage becomes right. uh, paid for. Or I hate to say it, the funding may need to come from the Koch brothers right. because that may make it credible in red states. I don't know. And, and you know, I, I'm like, like if, if, if Soros were to fund the perfect solution, nobody in the middle of the country would pick it up because he's been effectively demonized by the machine that's busy eating everybody's minds in this electoral cycle and before. So, so the big trend right now is benefit corporations. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it supersedes 501c3. Benefit corporations are clearly for profit. 
um, but um, and in, in, a, in a sense of paying salaries and uh, paying for their own growth, but not for shareholder value. If I had a magic button to push, I would make every corporation in the U.S. a public benefit corporation. Right. I would force all of the large C-Corps to become public benefit corps and then shift out the leadership and make them actually think about the social mission as important. I would force them all to disclose the skeletons in their closet. So we, you know, I would have them all have truth and reconciliation commissions so we could get over the crap that's, that's buried, that's keeping them from actually being honest. I would uh, cap executive pay. All these things are part of the problem. Yeah, but we could create a, sh a benefit, uh, a corporate Absolutely. shed. Absolutely. Right? <clears throat> Absolutely. And that would be a really, really great project for uh, OGM, by the way. Like, uh, you know, a lot of us are, are, are eager to sort of get busy and do stuff. And framing up a simple public benefit corporation that's doing some of the things you're talking about that can set up, uh, that would be lovely. Um, so maybe that maybe we do another call and focus somewhere there. I mean, that does that smell like it's in the middle of what we're talking about? Yeah. You've got to go and I've got to go too. Yeah, right. <laughs> you're muted again, Judy, but, but we hear you. Um, <laughs> Judy, Judy and Anthony, you both, you both have um, windows behind your head and it just makes you harder to see. So if you draw the blinds, you'll be easier to see on, the, on video calls, just, just as, a, as a video tip. Thank um, you, I understand and, that, but I've tried dropping the shades. It doesn't help a lot. It doesn't help that much? Shoot, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can also relocate your desk so that you're across the light. So I have a big window. Well, I have a I, big window to my I, left. What I can do is turn on the lights that are here that I didn't do this morning. That helps a little bit. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Um, we can. Thanks, Judy. Um, thanks, everybody else. Klaus, thank you very, very much. I, 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 we ate the middle of our time by going around, but I think we made the conversation uh, richer that way. So let's do this again. Rob, good luck with your proposal. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for joining. And uh, let's do our, let's do another one. Okay. Cool.